right. Um, good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are to everybody. Um, I'm David Mednikoff. I'm um, a professor of public policy and Middle Eastern studies and chair of the Judaic and Near Eastern Studies Department at UMass Amherst. And um, I'm also the the co-chair of the um, of the Outreach and Engagement Committee this year. So I've, I've had the good fortune of working with my colleagues and bringing together a really fantastic um, lineup of, of speakers um, that, you know, we have the, the benefit of being able to um, bring to bring from and to a good geographical range because of Zoom. Um, but um, today's speaker is actually somebody who's um, uh, like I like our speaker last time, who's you know a local and really a friend of UMass and a friend of SPP. So it's really nice to have um, Professor Jennifer Taub here, um, you know, from from down the road in Northampton and down the road a little bit further from Western New England Law School. Um, and I'll say I'll give you an introduction to her um, in a little more detail in just a second. Um, I. I I I I suspect it's it's this is a really I mean uh, the, the the issue that that Professor Taub's going to talk about in her book is is really significant and I think the timing is really good to have her her talk today because this is one of these things that um, goes beyond you know sort of the last year or two of the Trump administration and and really is something that um, perhaps this this you know could be a moment where where we see the really high level policy work that she's been doing on this, you know, ha have an impact. Um, so even though this book that I'm going to that, that she's going to talk about has been out for a few months, um, I, I'm delighted that this this is sort of the time that that we are able to hear from her about it. Um, I, I suspect that the gorgeous weather could be, uh, at least in the Amherst area, could be um, driving our numbers a little more down than than, than typical for, for our sessions. Um, and again, I think that this is, um, as, as I think Krista might have already noted in the chart, chat, that this is really a fantastic book. Um, and it's, you know, it's a book that's gotten a lot of national attention and it's been reviewed by the New York Times very favorably, among other places. Um, let me say something about Professor Taub um, and just something about the, the rules of the game. I think I'll, uh, of our session, I'll do it in reverse order. We're, we're, and because we're smaller, you know, I don't think we have to be super formal, but, um, our general rules of the game are, is that our speaker will present for 25, 30 minutes um, and then open it up to questions. The easiest way to handle questions, as most of you know by now, um, is um, by posting the question in the chat or at least say that you want to ask a question in the chat. That way, when it's time for me to moderate the questions, um, I can know what order people have put their questions um, up in. So. You know, if you have a question, feel free to post it as soon as you have a sense that you have one, and then I'll, I'll call on you. I might group um, questions together, and feel free when it, when I've called on you to um, to ask your question. And I will remind you that um, everybody sort of starts by default muted, so we'll invite you to unmute when you're going to ask a question. Um, and Professor Taub will, you know, stay in for for about an hour. So we'll get to if people have questions, we can get lots of answers. And, and this is a big issue again that um, I think ought to elicit lots of questions and comments and concerns from everybody. Um, I also want to welcome um, students and colleagues from um, from the UC Riverside Public Policy School. That's been sort of you all have been, you know, with us this year, and it's been really nice to have you, and it's nice to have some of you here today. And I'm not sure if anybody from our partner institute in India, um, JKLU, is on the is on the is on the meeting. But if so, you know, delighted to have you here too. I know the time differences are are major. Um, so welcome everybody, and welcome to Professor Taub. Um, so Professor Jennifer Taub is a professor of law at Western New England Law School. Um, our our law school, um, our, our basically local, you know, fantastic law school nearby. Um, and, you know, this is, yeah, this is one of the, the rare situations where I uh, get to welcome a fellow from a different period, but a fellow, fellow Harvard Law School person. So um, her, her bachelor's is from Yale and her, her, her JD is from Harvard Law School. Um, I'm just gonna give you a very brief bio. I put in the chat, which I hope is visible, 
a longer bio. I mean, it's really, she has done quite a lot. Uh, and I think, you know, like many really good policy and law scholars, she's not just done a lot of scholarship, she's done a lot of scholarship that's, you know, relevant and engaged and, and, and helpful to all of us. Um, she has devoted her career to making complex business law topics engaging inside and outside of the classroom. Um, in general, she, she teaches and writes um, on corporate governance, banking and financial market regulation, as well as white collar crime, which will be the primary focus of today's talk. Um, she puts it that her advocacy centers on um, following the money and you, you know questions or matters around following the money, um, tr promoting transparency and opposing corruption, which again are you know just such important issues at this moment. She's gonna talk about her recent book, Big Dirty, Big Dirty Money, the shocking injustice and unseen cost of white collar crime, which is out by Viking Press. Uh, like Krista, I, I think that it's, you know, and any of you who've seen the book already, it's really a wonderful, accessible and significant book. Um, Professor Taub, and I know this, you know, from just knowing her and from Facebook has been really engaged in a variety of public um, advocacy issues, uh, particularly, you know, during the last Trump administration, which in many ways, I think, um, amplified and exemplified the things that she writes about in Big Dirty Money. Um, so she co-founded and organized the April 15, 2017 tax march, where more than 120,000 people gathered in cities nationwide to demand President Trump release his tax returns, which I guess unfortunately didn't yield the results that we all would have expected, but you know, I guess it's not much of a surprise. Um, at, at Western New England, where she's a professor, she teaches civil procedure, white collar crime, and other business and commercial law classes. She used to teach at the Eisenberg School um, here at UMass, so she's a friend of UMass, and used to be a professor at Vermont Law School, and who also taught as a visiting professor at, 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 at Harvard Law School. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Um, I, I definitely commend you to her, her long bio, just to see again, as we've seen with some of our other co colleagues this year, what a fantastic track record of kind of public um, engagement as well as really, you know, good and insightful scholarship related to policy looks like. Um, and just having said that, I'm really delighted to, you know, introduce friend of UMass, um, friend and, and neighbor, um, Professor Jennifer Taub. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for that introduction, David. It's great to be here and I guess working with you in some capacity. I wanna thank you and the School of Public Policy, but also my uh, dear friend in the entire department, um, uh, Jerry Epstein and the Econ Department. And I saw Lenore Palladino was here. Um, when I was at UMass Eisenberg School, um, I found my family, I found my intellectual home through Perry and through uh, uh, Jerry in the Econ Department. And he was very welcoming of me right after the global financial crisis of 2008 in the fall of 2009 when I'd written a paper um, on the topic and really brought me in to a world um, where I was able to engage in policy. Um, so I just, uh, I just wanna say that it, it's nice to come home um, to UMass and it's also nice to be working closer to home. Um, so given all the nice things that, that uh, you, and apparently I didn't get to see uh, Krista's comment um, on the chat, um, all the nice things you're saying about me, I feel like I need to be you know, fair and balanced um, uh, in quotes. And so I have also this, um, this on the front, pa front page of these slides, I've included um, an uh, anonymous Amazon review um, in which uh, we're told um, the other side of the story about my book, and I just love this so much. Um, let me just read it to you. Um, this is exactly the type of garbage that is polluting the minds of our youth. A horribly written book that not only will I not give away, but will burn at the next campfire. Atlas Shrugged is literature. This is rubbish. Um, anyway, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, and now I know that, you know, I was delighting in that, but I think probably by contract, both my agent and my publisher might be unhappy if I didn't also sort of quickly let you know that, look, yes, some people like the book. Um, I think my favorite thing was James B. Stewart. Uh, he was, he wrote the book, um, Den of Thieves, 
about Michael Milken. Some of you are old enough to remember Michael Mil Milken um, before he was pardoned by Donald Trump, was convicted for various uh, federal crimes, including um, securities fraud. Um, but anyway, James Stewart wrote about that period of time. And um, what I liked is that he understood the class aspect of this. And he said um, that, my, that a lot of people had written books about white collar crime, but that I explicitly and pervasive, persuasively placed the breakdown of enforcement and accountability in the context of money and class. So I'm gonna be talking about that today. So my, my um, it's so weird to be doing this this way where I can't see, um, see your faces um, or, uh, I mean, I can see your faces, but I can't sort of read the room and say, um, you know, if this is going well. So I'm just gonna assume that um, when we take a break, you can, you can, pipe, you can pipe up with some, some questions and things that concerned you, made you happy or angry, please jot your notes down so you don't, you don't forget. Uh, okay, so what I wanna do is define the problem that the book focuses on um, describe some of the proposals, including the benefits and the shortcomings that are laid out in the book and invite your questions. Um, but before I do that, I wanna do a quick reading um, from the preface, um, just to give you a sense of the writing style and what we're talking about when we're talking about white collar crime. And then I have some introductions uh, to do. So um, this is, I'm reading right here from the preface, which is entitled Crime Scene. This will be brief. Big cheaters often prosper and they do it right in front of our faces. You can see them almost daily on the front page of the paper, in your Twitter feed and on broadcast and cable news programs. Rogues to riches stories are common now. Cheating the public and getting away with it is the new normal. Turn on the television today and you're more likely to see wealthy, well-connected white men secure presidential pardons than watch one get convicted and sent to prison. Just after Valentine's Day in 2020, President Donald Trump granted clemency to a slew of affluent felons. Their offenses, bribery, investment fraud, tax evasion, Medicare fraud, public corruption, computer hacking, and extortion cover-up, money laundering, conspiracy to defraud the federal government, obstruction of justice, mail fraud, wire fraud. No white collar crime left behind. The official White House announcement used the word successful four times to describe these elite outlaws but made no mention of the ordinary people they victimized. Now I'm cutting forward to one more excerpt from the preface and then I'll be done with that. This is in a section of the preface called implicit immunity. We also have a double standard in the American criminal justice system that reflects and perpetuates inequality. Cutting legal corners is a tool for advancement only available to the already affluent. The wealthy not only increase their power by evading punishment, but also benefit from a criminal justice system that incarcerates those with lower social status who also attempt to use crime to get ahead. Selling loose cigarettes on a New York City sidewalk can lead to a chokehold arrest and death. Eric Garner, a middle-aged black man, was surrounded by police officers, tackled and suffocated for what was just a small time tax dodge. Garner was selling cigarettes purchased cheaper by the pack out of state and selling them one by one to passersby. Tax evasion, depriving New York state and city of nearly $5.85 per pack. The Department of Justice decided not to prosecute the police officer who killed Garner. The reasoning? The powers that be believed he had not used excessive force under the circumstances. Racism is baked in to that conclusion. Can you imagine cops circling, tackling, and choking 
a white woman who was poised to drop her fraudulent tax return in a city mailbox? How would that not be considered excessive force? So thank you. Okay, so because we can't go around this room, we don't have a room and do introductions, I'd like to do some alternative introductions, um, which will help illuminate uh, the argument the book is making. Here's one. This is Wells Fargo CEO, John Stump. On his watch between 2009 and 2016, the bank opened more than 3.5 million bank accounts without authorization. This is something they admitted to later. They also repossessed cars because of unnecessary insurance when people couldn't pay those uh, premiums. Um, and the bank along the way retaliated against employees who resisted participating in this scheme. Um, he did not, um, he did not uh, get prosecuted. Instead, um, he was asked to resign. He was essentially fired, um, but he got $134 million exit payment. And that's after um, any penalties for the board imposed on him. Then in 2020, the main bank regulator for, um, for Wells Fargo, the Office of the Control of the Currency, um, fined him um, a small fine, some you know tens of millions of dollars, doesn't really make much of a dent on that exit payment or his accumulation of wealth over the years. And they banned him um, from the industry. This is a 66 year old man who'd already retired. No criminal charges were ever brought against him. Another illustration, Governor Bob uh, McDonald, known as Bob for Jobs, he was elected in 2000, he, was a, he became governor in 2009, uh, governor of Virginia. And before um, the election and during his term in office, he accepted $175,000 in cash loans, luxury vacations, even a silver Rolex, Rolex watch that was engraved with his initials um, from Johnny Williams, who was a businessman in exchange for access to people in the governor's circle, setting up meetings and attempting to get um, research scientists from the university to do research for some um, hopeless product he was trying to push that was tobacco based. Um, he, the governor's bribery conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court because nothing, even though there was clearly a quid pro quo, there's no question he took all this money um, and, and uh, vacations and you know, um, you know, some of the cash was for his daughter's wedding. That was absolutely in exchange for access but the problem is access and meetings um, do not count as an official act so that it was not considered bribery. And we also have um, uh, the big drug gang, um, the Sackler family. Um, this, uh, the Sackler family, one branch of it, it was involved in the Purdue Pharma business. They earned, the company earned $35 billion peddling Oxycontin, a drug they um, mislabeled. Um, they made, the family made $14 billion. They had already, now you may know recently of um, the settlement with the Department of Justice that the uh, company, um, not the family, entered into to settle the most recent criminal charges. But the company had already pleaded guilty in 2006 and was still operating um, and, and uh, you know, breaking the law since then. So they were kind of repeat offenders. Um, they did not commit a victimless crime. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died due to prescription opioid overdoses um, alone uh, between 99 and 2017. Um, now only a portion of that was from the Oxycontin drug, but they were the ones who, who launched and created that market, um, lying to doctors, paying kickbacks to distributors to act as if this was going to be less addictive um, and less deadly than other um, forms of opioids. They pushed it, they created a market where there really shouldn't have been one. There should have been a drug for end of life care and cancer pain, not for what it was used for, and of course not ultimately for abuse. Um, so what's happening recently with them? Um, I only put this here and I can share my slides for folks who want it, but um, just the other day, um, they're trying to enter into this, this is the thing on the right, a restructuring plan. And luckily, Amora Keeley, who is the AG here in Massachusetts, 
um, is, is not happy about the bankruptcy plan. The bankruptcy plan is, de is designed to deal with all the state law and tribal and private actions, civil actions brought against Purdue Pharma, under which the Sacklers would be giving up a lot of money um, in control of the company, but would still be fabulously wealthy. On the left on these slides, I have this statement made um, in the last few months by, oh, sorry, not the last few months, under the Trump administration's Department of Justice back in October or November, where they announced this giant resolution um, at the federal level of these new charges against Purdue Pharma. But what you'll notice, there's civil and criminal charges, but if you'll notice what, uh, this, this criminal plan, um, somehow the company is admitting guilt, but then the civil settlement has family members involved. Somehow these crimes get committed and people get really rich, um, but no one goes to jail. Okay, but sometimes people go to jail um, and we can look at uh, Martin Screlly, Farmer bro, you may remember him. He did not go to prison for smirking and having a very punchable face um, or even marking up um, the price of drugs. Instead, it was securities fraud. Um, and he, one thing he said, and I'm mindful of my time, David, I know I've got four minutes, um, but when he was, um, when he was being, um, before the guilty verdict, he sort of laughed and said, big deal, I'll go to a club fed. He was right, he did, that's where people go. He claimed he could play black basketball and tennis and Xbox for a couple months. He's wrong, there is no Xbox um, in federal prison, but there are other things. This is Otisville, it's where Michael Cohen went. He, Michael Cohen and others called a camp. This is literally one of the club feds. Um, when you go to the website, you can see the orientation memos the commissary lists, everything from Twizzlers to matzo balls and sunglasses. Um, sure, no one likes to lose their liberty, but this is not, um, this is not where the bad boys um, that we see uh, committing street crimes go. Okay, so in brief, what I identify in the book is that we have an elite in corporate crime spree um, where there's a kind of implicit immunity for the white, wealthy, and well-connected. Um, we have limited enforcement resources um, put to use to target this kind of criminality and the laws um, that have been enacted that are designed to get at it. One example I gave is the anti-bribery statutes have been weakened by Supreme Court decisions. We have victims remaining in the shadows um, and not being treated like true victims of these crimes and not given a voice. Um, the people who are most likely to uncover these crimes throughout history, corporate and, high, and, and, and crimes of the powerful individuals, are journalists who are under threat, not just physical threat, but financial threat, funding their um, threats, and whistleblowers, there's a hodgepodge of whistleblower regimes that need to be fixed. We have the IRS that's underfunded and we have inconsistent, unreliable data at the federal and state level. The solutions I make and suggest in the book is to create a new elite crime division within the Department of Justice that coordinates across the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office to prioritize detecting, um, deterring, prosecuting, um, and enforcing further um, you know, crimes committed by the most powerful. Um, in the book, I'm very clear about my definition of white collar crime, wanting to return to something that um, Edwin Sutherland, who coined the term, um, wanted to be, which is focused more on status and on conduct. We can maybe talk about that in the Q&A. I want to create a white collar cr criminal offender database. Um, I want to empower whistleblowers and journalists. I have ideas about, about doing that, specifically expanding some of the whistleblower protection laws and giving broader standing to individuals to bring claims of fraud, even if they don't have individual standing. Um, and um, we need to better fund the IRS clearly. Um, and fund agencies um, better that can track these offenses. And so these slides really just go through. Um, and if you have questions, those are the plans. Um, one area before I close, I'm mostly interested in is, is this empowering of whistleblowers by expanding the False Claims Act. Um, and I, you know, I can talk more about that if people have questions. It's something that dates back to uh, the Civil War era. It's called Lincoln's Law or the Informer's Law. Um, it's been extremely uh, successful um, since it was expanded in 86 um, to allow, to return the ability to pay bounties fees to whistleblowers. Um, they, the federal government has received more than $53 billion misappropriated by federal contractors. The trouble with this false claims law is it only applies to fraud committed by 
federal government contractors, their state law equivalents. And I have an idea of expanding that. And that's going to be a law journal article that I am working on now. Um, so my parting thoughts are to say um, that I'd like to um, imagine a world where the government had actually held the former guy accountable for the many offenses he committed over the many decades um, since he jumped into his father's um, uh, you know, real estate empire. And I firmly believe that um, if he had been held accountable, he would have spent time in a federal prison camp instead of the Oval Office. Um, I think we, we have to, uh, in expelling him and pursuing him criminally, that's only one piece of things. I think we need to think about a world where we don't um, allow, um, we allow the wealthy to gain wealth in power and sustain it through crime, um, or we're going to really be the kleptocracy that Trump, I believe, was setting us on the path to becoming. Your questions are welcome, and I'm going to I'm going to end my screen sharing now. Thank you. Are you still there, David? Sorry, my screen was locked. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I think I, I was so enthusiastic about my introduction that I probably, you know, you, you probably would have been fine speaking for a little more, but hopefully we'll, we'll get some, some of the nuances in, in the, in the QA. So I know that um, um, Professor Palladino and Professor Harper both have questions. So why don't we start with, uh, with, with you in order. <clears throat> sure. Hi, um, that was great. And in case anybody um, hasn't yet purchased or read the book. Um, it was so good that I gave it for uh, Christmas presents to my family, <laughs> which uh, tells you something also about my family, but uh, <laughs> everyone really enjoyed it. So two things that I would love to hear more about. The first is what you mentioned in terms of how you define white collar crime. And I would just love to hear maybe for the, for the legal geeks, uh, myself included, a little bit more about that. And then two, I think, it would be, you know, we've all just lived through the Trump era, but it'd be really interesting to hear your just impressions of how public awareness and or, um, you know, feelings of cynicism <laughs> about the ability to actually tackle these problems as a society might have already pre-existed in the Obama era and or um, changed during the Trump era. So just kind of your I don't know, political political read on how much attitude there might be at this point or exhaustion in thinking about dealing with white collar crime. So thanks. Great questions and thank you. Should I take Krista's at the same time or should I do one at a time, David? Uh, sure, go ahead and take Krista's, thanks. Okay. Krista, what kind of dog is that with Michael? I don't mean Michael, I mean the dog. <laughs> He's a good boy. <laughs> this is Dewey. And he is a Bichon poodle mix and he got he got bathed recently, which is giving him almost a cloud like halo effect. So, yeah, yeah he's a good boy. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So my my question is, um, are there any are there any examples of countries that get it right or do this better than uh, the United States, because you can think of actually a lot of places where uh, the corruption cases uh, are so bad that they're famous and we've heard about them over here. Um, but are there any places that actually successfully, you know, sort of enforce clean, um, you know, white collar or, uh, or clean, you know, government official kind of uh, legislation? I love these questions. Okay, so let me start, and I'm going to be as concise as I can and mindful of the time. Um, and I, each time I'll let people know whether I've dealt with this in the book in more detail or whether I need to. So starting with Lenora's question, how do I define white collar? First question, how do I find white collar crime? Um, and also, why is that important? Um, and I like, I am borrowing, let me back up and say, the term was coined in 1939 by a um, sociologist from Indiana University by the name of Edwin Sutherland. 
And he had been researching the, the topic of what he called white collar criminality for a decade by that time. He gave, he was the president, he was the outgoing president of the American Sociological Society. And they were having a joint annual meeting in Philadelphia with the American Economics Association. Um, and so the, it's, it was quite, quite an interesting, I mean, to me, an interesting meeting. Most people probably think it sounds really boring. Um, and he introduced this idea. He was trying to challenge um, what criminologists and sociologists thought of as crime. And not surprisingly, um, and I don't think so much has differed in the way we frame it, crime was things that were committed by mostly poor people in cities, um, and they were um, crimes of violence or crimes of um, property crimes of theft, right? That's how crime was defined. And sociologists who were looking at crime to study it were specifically looking at something called the UCR, Uniform Crime Reports. And this UCR still exists. It's put out by the FBI gathered from state and localities. But the UCR data, when it counts crime, it only looks at, um, it, crime gets, starts to be counted when law enforcement makes an arrest. Okay, so he had a problem with that definition. And he defined this term white collar criminal to try to get at what that left out, what the UCR data left out and what also um, the, 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 the way crime was defined. So he defined white collar criminals as people of high social status and respectability who commit crimes in the course of their occupation. That's almost, I'm almost saying it verbatim. So his definition leads with status Right, so to me, the way I look at it is, you know, it, it, you could say it's a Venn diagram, but you first have to look at people of um, respectability um, and high social status who are committing some kind of crime in the course of their occupation, some kind of financial crime. That's how he defined it. But to be even more clear, he did not want to use, um, he did not define, he went, for the purpose of sociological studies, as opposed to who you put in prison, he wanted to look at white collar crime as including even regulatory, civil regulatory offenses or crime um, that's never prosecuted or individuals caught up in a crime that themselves didn't get convicted. So let me give you an example of that last piece. He made the point of saying that when people studied organized crime, mob behavior at the time, they talked about the mob as organized crime even if the members of it weren't prosecuted. We do that even today, right? And they did that and so sociologists did. But what he noticed was when it came to things like, um, or if, if someone was involving in a, in a kidnapping, you know, you would, everyone who was involved in a kidnapping would probably be prosecuted and arrested, but you would consider them all part of this crime. But when it came to insurance fraud, often the people involved in insurance fraud, not everybody involved was ever sort of prosecuted and he would still want to study that as a subject. So that was that was what what he was trying to do. Over the so that that was 1939. I told you I'd be brief, but I think this is su is super important here. It, Ten years later, in 1949, he wrote a book called White Collar Crime, and that book even zeroed more narrowly in on corporate criminality. That entire book is only almost exclusively about corporate crime, but. Sutherland died shortly after the book was published, which meant he did not get to this really important legacy. He did not get to flesh out. He did have some students who did, but the, what happened after he died is over the years, lawyers like me um, shifted from a status definition to a conduct definition because lawyers, our power, if we're not being legal theorists, lawyers, practicing lawyers, are interested in, right, um, if you're a prosecutor, proving the elements of a crime are beyond a reasonable doubt in order to put someone in prison or find them, right? That, that's just like how that system works. So when we teach white collar crime, we're teaching particular usually federal offenses or federal theories for either holding corporate entities criminally liable or holding people who um, commit financial type of crime that's not related to vice crime accountable. So when we teach white collar crime, we're teaching 
like generic statutes like conspiracy or false statements or wire fraud or the various types of fraud. So, and the reason why I read you the introduction is I was showing you in an offense-based definition, the kinds of statutes that are used to prosecute these people, right? But part of my project is to redefine white collar crime to think of it as um, a tool used by, the, stat by the, the very wealthy to distort democracy and distort the use of our public resources. So that's in terms of definitions. In terms of, did this just happen under Trump? Absolutely not. Hi, Jerry. Um, I was thanking you at the beginning. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> you're muted, but I know you're just saying you showed up late. That's fine. I showed up late because I couldn't get into the thing, but finally I got in, so sorry about that. That's all right, it's being taped. Don't worry, Jerry. You'll hear all the nice things back. Um, but yes, I think the failure to prosecute bankers after the um, financial crisis is critical, Lenore. And I write about that in this book. I think that Eric Holder um, really did break the cycle of the that we see over time with corporate crackdowns um, by you know by failing to do that. And you know, I kind of go into or, or you know you could say Lanny Brewer, um, or you could actually put you know you could say Barack Obama himself. But I'm beginning to think of the Justice Department, you know, in terms of the rule of law, is separate. And that really was Eric Holder's job. You know, I don't see that as, you know, he had the power to do it, so did Lanny Brewer, and they didn't put the priorities there. And I, if you're, for those of us who are sort of into the, the nuances of that, I explain that in great detail, I think, in the chapter called Corporate Crime Waves and Crackdowns. And I think if anyone wants to, I'm happy to send, David, if you want to, you can send me an email. I'd be happy to send that particular chapter or any of them around, because I think it explains where they fell down there. Um, okay, the next question Krista had asked about, um, was do other countries do this better? Um, and it depends on what your what your goals are. I mean, I think the answer to that is not that I've seen, but there are different. If you look at the sort of buffet, you know, approach to this, there are some things in other countries that I would like us to adopt. And one thing I think is very cool that happens in the UK is this thing called the um, an I'm going to say the language wrong. It's called something like an unexplained assets order. So if, if you suddenly have this giant boat or mansion or something that looks like, or a hotel chain or something, it, the, uh, the government can say, could you please show us um, where you got the financial, you know, where you got the resources, show us the cash flow that, that, that allowed you to purchase that, which I think is a really kind of fantastic idea. I haven't explored of that um, it in greater detail. The first time I heard about this was a student when I was, when I was, um, visiting at Harvard Law School in the fall of 2019 and teaching a class on white collar crime. One of the students was from Ireland and she told me about this and I've only seen it mentioned once elsewhere. And so I feel like I need, and you know, this is the third time people have asked, I need to do that. Countries that I think, you know, get it wrong in the other direction is China. Like I'm not for capital punishment, even for Ponzi schemes, right? Um, does that sound, I, Michael Ash is like, well, uh, I don't know. No, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not. You know, I, I think that's not the way to handle things. I laugh, but it's, it's it, you know, I'm not for capital punishment period, which brings me to, you know, the other, other areas. If you're really interested in this in the international sense, one of my favorite new books on this topic is called Cliptopia um, by, um, is it Burgess is his last name? He's in the UK. It's a very, it's kind of a winding narrative, but I've learned a lot about global kleptocracies. Enough to know that my one of my big concerns is the way in which um, corruption law is is used um, as a tool by people like Putin or Trump or others. You know, I could I can mention a bunch of Eastern European bloc countries, and the, there's sort of that it's that you, if you let your um, if you let the oligarchy become a kleptocracy, then you can control them, take your cut, and if they turn against you politically, prosecute them. And that's the side danger of the system we're talking about. Like I was talking about more as a tool to get ahead in corrupt democracy, but as, as this book came out, I became increasingly more aware about it as a way to, you know, is to further, um, further, um, you know, totalitarian regimes who can maintain power by allowing, you know, the sort of class beneath you to, to do this, so.
Um, so thank we, I know we have a question from CD. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. So I apologize and actually finish that off. But I'm actually curious because you're bringing up Donald Trump and we know that he's been tied to the Jeffrey Epstein. And we know that as Gillen and Maxwell comes up to trial that we're going to potentially see some further names come out on this. And I'm wondering how some of the white collar crimes have been and can potentially be associated to some of these new regulation and policy proposals. Um, because if this, if this case is gonna tell us anything, it's definitely gonna be about how financial wealthy white collar um, have been highly connected to an illegal money laundering uh, opportunity. I'm so glad you, you asked that. I, the chapter I have that's called, um, I've got to look at my own index, the chapter I have that's called Mutually Assured Immunity for the Upper Class talks about the interconnection um, between um, that kind of predatory behavior. Um, I, I mentioned Harvey Weinstein here. I mentioned um, oh gosh, uh, both Schneiderman and, um, why am I forgetting the guy? Um, I can almost see him. Um, who was the, who, who was visiting prostitutes in New York? Why am I forgetting him before Schneiderman? It's her. Spitzer, thank you. There's so many of them. Yes. Well, this, <laughs> so this is the problem, and it's the same damn thing with Cuomo. People who are like, "Oh, well, we can't get we can't get rid of Cuomo," and it's not the same thing. Cuomo is not the same degree as what we're talking about with Epstein, but it's all kind of the same thing, which is it was like, "Oh, we can't get rid of Cuomo because that 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 will make us, you know, more vulnerable to." bad actors like Republicans, like, you know, because they never get rid of their bad guys. And the trouble is engaging in um, criminal behavior of the, of the non-financial type that is sort of, that is covered up for by others makes you vulnerable, not just to blackmail, but to this kind of thing, which is um, what I call this um, mutually assured immunity, where, you know, you look at someone like Schneiderman, who was the um, attorney general of New York. And you have to wonder why it was just a civil RICO case brought against Trump for Trump University. You know, Trump obviously had the goods on Schneiderman because there were all those like, we know now, right? So you just cannot, um, there's that aspect where I believe there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, you can monetize implicitly um, that abusive conduct. And the other piece of what you're asking is when it, when you do, you know, when you do have damning, um, information about people that could hurt them, then there is a price. And we, we do wonder where, you know, Epstein, why he made so much money managing money, you know, might've been good at math, but a lot of people are good at math, right? And so there's that, that aspect of it. So I think see these things as linked and that's why when I define white collar criminality, I put in it, I look at the status of the individual and I would consider someone like Epstein a white collar criminal because of his status, regardless of whether he was you know, committing money laundering, which he obviously probably was. There's always money laundering and tax evasion whenever there's, um, vice of any kind too. So we, we have a question from, Mer from Professor Emeritus Eric Einhorn and from Professor Katz too. No, I, I don't have a question, just a comment really. I enjoyed the presentation. Um, first of all, I call people's attention to the editorial in the New York Times a couple of days ago about the IRS. Uh, there've been some follow-ups on, on, you know, also about how the tax system can be made more um, easier, but of course it would cost uh, HR Block and TurboTax a lot of money. So you get these kind of issues that are gray areas, and probably not illegal, but but are gray areas. Anyway, and the other question I, is uh, is um, just thinking more generally. Uh, we do know that there are different rates of crime in different countries uh, that we have reasonable statistics on. Is it reasonable to assume that white collar crime is lower in uh, more, more, let's say, low crime countries versus high crime countries? So comparing um, countries I know, like Denmark and Sweden, which have actually had some spectacular uh, white collar crimes, but that you can count them on, on, on one, maybe one hand and a finger or something like that, um, relative to population. So 
uh, is white collar crime. I mean, America has been called a country of criminals by, by uh, let's say, critics. And uh, <laughs> it's just part of the same business why we have more murders, more, you know, rapes, more, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Eric, so the thing is that the most, the most frustrating thing about studying this topic isn't just that there's not a shared definition among lawyers or even among sociologists or even across the government, is that there's no way to actually count and really know, right? Because we can talk about the factual commission of certain crimes, even if they're not detected, which we can never measure. But we, there's, there's no way for me to know, even, even the statistics the Department of Justice provides to the US Attorney's offices are inconsistent from year to year. And what they, they're gonna count someone who's a welfare fraud in the same bucket as they're gonna count someone who engaged in insider trading. It's, it's impossible for me to really know. So we can do the anecdotal stuff, right? And I, you know, I think it's reasonable to say that, you know, if there aren't as many corporations that are, there aren't gonna be, there's not gonna be as much corporate crime, but beyond that, you know, it's hard for me, it's hard for me to know. I, I do think though, uh, so I don't know the answer, but I want to go back to your question, um, your comment about the uh, New York Times editorial board opinion, which I did read. And for folks that, that aren't aware of this, it, it's very good because um, it, it talks about something I talk about in the book, but goes beyond it. I have a chapter called Tax and Punish, and I talk a lot about the tax gap. I think it's like 600 to 800 billion dollars a year of money that doesn't get collected. Um, and a lot of that, the data that they didn't, they don't use footnotes. I did that. A lot of that comes from ProPublica's reporting on this topic, Jesse Eisinger and Paul Keel did that reporting. But what, what you know, the way, you know, all of us think that you've got to staff up at the IRS, it's been, it's been gutted in order to get this. You need to prioritize going after big clients with offshore accounts instead of the low hanging fruit and all this stuff. But what, what they added here was a suggestion, which I think is brilliant, mm -hmm. is to require banks to report on their on inflows and outflows to bank accounts. So for, for all, all of you here, who get paychecks know we have withholding. You've seen that, right? And you, anyone here who's gotten um, paid on the side, you get 1099s, right? From, have you anyone here gotten this? Right, well, you don't, and if you have an investment account that if you happen to be lucky enough to have money that's not protected by a retirement account and you have capital gains, that gets reported also. But money going in and out of a bank account um, is not, automatically reported. So there's this idea that that could happen. And, you know, there, but then the, the Times admits that you need more people, the IRS, to deal with this. As for the whole thing with H&R Block, the reason why there should be free tax filing for people. And the reason why there isn't is because of Richie Neal, right? People like that. But yeah, I don't, you know, I would run for Congress if I lived in Springfield, but I don't. So can't solve that problem. So I, we have two more questions in the chat. So I, I guess I propose that um, professors um, Katz and Curtis just pose their questions and then you know you deal with them because I guess we're at the winding down point. But this is thank you. This has been very helpful. David, you're keeping the trains running on time. But what's the exact real stop? Ex actual stop point? Because I will stop before that. But yeah, I think you know we could probably go as late as one twenty. But um, okay. Yeah. Hi, Professor Todd. Thank you so much for taking the time to present about your book. This was awesome, is awesome. Um, this is perhaps, if, if you don't think this question is relevant, we can skip it. But I was reading Robert Caro's The Power Broker a few years back, which is about Robert Moses. Um, not the same topic, but I'm so struck in Caro's writing about the patterns of criminality that have been in New York City in particular for a really long time. We just witnessed Trump, who is so connected in New York, and a lot of his crime activity presumably was, you know, nurtured <laughs> there. Um, do you think there is any kind of, I don't know, regional quality or center of white collar crime or is it just ubiquitous and everywhere um, now or has it always been? Or is there something about New York and the connected quality of the networks of the upper high status kind of folks that has paved the way for white collar crime to flourish? So again, speaking um, anecdotally and also saying, I have been wanting to read The Power Broker for like a million years. Um, and I, I, I did see a Ken Burns documentary about Robert Moses, which was kind of incredible. But the answer to your question sort of anecdotally is, you know, New York 
you know, is that's where Wall Street, you know, that's where the money is, right? So that's where Wall Street is. That's where, you know, I, I think whenever you, if you're looking at white collar criminals, they're going to, you know, like Willie Sutton go to where the money is. And that if that, if there's a big pile of money, um, th there can be crime. I mean, I think a lot of the places we're going to find the biggest crime are pension funds, which could be anywhere in the country, right? Because you have people not keeping eye on billions of dollars and people skimming money off. I think, you know, I think tax fraud is tremendous. Where is that located though, right? You could say it's located in DC because that's where the where it's due, but it's also located wherever the most wealthy reside. So, I mean, I actually think, you know, um, you know, I think Delaware, um, you know, for, I mean, that's not shell company law is changing. I think Delaware is a huge place for, you know, um, because that's where a lot of shell corporations and big corporations are located and they can use that um, to shelter assets. So, I, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I do think that what I will say is you're going to always sort of like, um, just like we, like, just like Jesus said, you know, it's almost Passover. I'm a nice Jewish girl. Just like Jesus said, the poor will always be with us. You know, cr criminality and white collar crime will always be with us, but we don't want it to be, you, know, you can't put everybody in jail. That's impossible. That's why we need better regulation up front. That's why we need a more confiscatory tax system because even if people get wealthy, like you can, let me just make this comment, which I've been meaning to make. It doesn't really, I mean, how do I say this in a way that doesn't sound wrong? Elon Musk and um, Jeff Bezos, we saw this, the, you know, have more wealth than the lower 40% of the country. Does it really matter if they came by that honestly? How is that any worse than the many people who, um, you know, be, of course the rule of law matters, but in terms of the effect on our democracy, having that much inequality in and of itself is a problem. So I believe our existing tax structure is creating a kind of criminogenic system. It's impossible to have a democracy with that much inequality. And so the tax structure, as well as the not, you know, defunding the police. We've defunded the police when it comes to tax enforcement. And I see all this sort of in one thing. So I guess, Professor Katz, um, that's the answer to the question, which is yes, to the extent that's where the money is, that's where the crime will be. So we have one more question from Professor Curtis, um, apropos to kind of decoupling um, what kinds of things have to be regulated to address this. So please go ahead. Yeah, forgive me for not turning on my video, um, but won't. Diane, I won't forgive you, but you can say those words. <laughs> you can just imagine me on a boat right now. It'll be it'll make us all happier. Um, okay. The uh, so the other place where the money is is politics, right? So how you know I want to see change. I want you to give me hope that we can regulate white collar crime better. But I'm very skeptical so long as we're not reforming campaign finance. Um, in some very, you know, strong way. So can you address that a little bit about how those work hand Why in hand? Why always end with a Citizens United question, Diane? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's, you know, I, I, but I, I, I've set you up for this a little bit, which is, yeah, I think we've got to deal with Citizens United. I think we have to deal with unlimited corporate spending, you know, it's so-called independent spending on elections. But then I'm also going to put Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk there and say they're not corporations, they're people, and we have to deal with that as well. So there's a lot I think we need to, I think we absolutely have to, I mean, there's a chapter on public corruption, but there's also a real need to um, reform there. What I want to ask you to do, I know you're super busy, but maybe I'm going to invite you to, or I'll have maybe we'll Zoom chat about the, uh, the organization I'm on the board of called Free Speech for People, which is trying to work on those issues. Great. Um, so I, I think um, you know it's a beautiful day. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a good it's a good hopeful way to end it. I, I, I certainly have lots more things that I love to ask and engage you in, and I'm sure that everybody else does here as well. Um, so we're grateful that you're local and you're available, and that your book is there, and that you know the, oh, those of us who haven't seen it. The paperback is coming out in yeah. June, you guys. Excellent. And we'll have a white cover. So, um, be smaller. Nice. So um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for being here, and and Professor Tubb, I really am very grateful that you know you've done, you've done you've done another excellent um, 
very engaged policy talk in this series. Um, uh, Marcy or um, Mo, when is our, our next one? Is the end of April, is that correct? Um, yes, um, April 26th um, at noon with Nikki Sheets. Uh, Monday okay, on environmental justice. So we'll have plenty of publicity as always about that. But thanks again, everybody, in particular, Professor Taub for um, spending your, your beautiful um, Monday afternoon with us this way and see everybody again soon. Bye. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. You.